Today's lecture is about the Second Great Awakening. We're going to be talking about religion again, um, but uh, there's uh, more going on with this lecture, I think, than just religion. Um, the Second Great Awakening ties in with a lot of the things we've been talking about in this course. Religion, quite obviously. But in addition, the Second Great Awakening uh, has a very interesting connection to the theme of democracy we've been talking about. The Second Great Awakening is democracy uh, evident in religion very clearly. Um, and in fact, there's uh, a certain amount of hostility toward the upper crust, religious upper crust, in the Second Great Awakening. It's a very characteristic part of it, particularly among denominations like the Baptists and Methodists. Um, Presbyterians as well. So it's tied in with democracy. It's also tied in with a very important departure from the First Great Awakening. And this is the thing that distinguishes the First and Second Great Awakenings uh, most clearly, in my opinion. And that's the idea of reform. People in the Second Great Awakening aren't just concerned with going to heaven. They're not just concerned with the state of their own souls. They're concerned as well with the state of society, and that leads them to try to reform the world. They want to prepare the world for the second coming of Jesus Christ. They want to make the world worthy of uh, God's return. Uh, and so they come up with a whole series of things to improve the world and make it better and to help their, their fellow suffering souls and um, uh, and this is very, very important. It's important for a reason we're not going to talk about today, but we'll talk about in our next lecture. It's important for um, the fact that one of these reforms is abolitionism. Uh, so the anti-slavery movement is very, very closely related to the Second Great, Great Awakening. And this is where the course... Uh, turns toward the question of the Civil War and, once again, the question of slavery in America. So, um, after today, we're going to be talking, we're really going to be explaining the Civil War in the course, um, uh, and it's all tied in with this religious reform movement. So, a lot of, lot of interesting threads coming together uh, today. So we're going to talk about how the Second Great Awakening starts in the back country, particularly the southern back country. Then we're going to talk about um, how it changes when it becomes a middle class movement. Then we are going to look at how the awakening changes its style, particularly in the case of one of the great ministers associated with the Second Great Awakening, Charles Finney. Uh, and then we're going to look at reform particularly the reform of temperance, the most, uh, the largest uh, reform movement that comes out of the Second Great Awakening, and I would argue the second most important after abolitionism. And then we're going to look at uh, different varieties of reform in the Second Great Awakening. You know, if you ask people today, what would you do to improve the world? If you ask 50 people, well, we might get, you know, 50 answers. Uh, same thing in the Second Great Awakening. People want to reform, they want to improve the world, they come up with all kinds of different ideas about how to do that. Uh, so we'll go through some of them very quickly. The use today, Second Great Awakening unleashed tremendous religious energies energies in democratizing America. Uh, that's absolutely true. Uh, if there's one word you can use to describe the Second Great Awakening, it's energetic. Um, secondly, the reform impulse uh, grew out of an impulse rooted in the awakening to perfect the world for God. So uh, once again, we're going to reform the world to improve it. Uh, and then thirdly, 19th century American reform movements are tremendously varied. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll show you, show you that going along. All right, back country revivals. This is a map of a camp meeting. The camp meeting is the thing that starts the Second Great Awakening. Second Great Awakening, you know, there's no really clear starting point for it. Maybe the American Revolution in some sense. Um, the American Revolution, particularly in the South, chases away a lot of the Tories. And when the Tories are chased away, the Church of England uh, is largely chased away too. So there's this tremendous vacuum in the South for religion, and particularly in the back country, the trans Appalachian back country, where uh, uh, new, um, new uh, pioneers are now beginning to penetrate. So there are all these unchurched people in the backwoods. And 
um, what happens to those people is that they begin to be converted by these new evangelical denominations like the Baptist and Methodist, who have tremendous amount of energy and fervor. Um, so these new denominations would send these young ministers out there, all these young men full of energy, full of hope, um, not having a wife and kids to hold them back. Uh, and they go out into the backwoods and they they do the work of converting the country people. Well, the country people would get together for the revival meetings. Uh, and these camp meetings, as they became known, always took place in the summer, obviously, you know, when the weather's good. And they develop a pattern by 1800 or so. And 1800 is probably the date where we'd say that the Second Great Awakening kicks off. There's a famous revival meeting in Cane Ridge, Kentucky in 1800, um, and uh, uh, that's as good a date as any to say that we've got the Second Great Awakening on our hands in the backcountry. Um, so how do camp meetings work? Well, here you'd see um, there's a stage set up quite often a covered platform. This is where the preaching will be done. In front of that, there are benches, and the benches are divided uh, by a sex, women's seats and men's seats. Uh, and then behind there are the camp, the, uh, the tents and the fires for people who are um, attending, the, um, uh, attending the revival. Uh, and this is a southern revival, so we can see behind the stage there are Negro tents set up. Um, and slaves were absolutely part of the Second Great Awakening. I'll talk about, a little bit about more of the, uh, about that in a while. So, these revivals start out in the backwoods uh, and they become very popular. Here's a camp meeting of the Methodist, 1819. Same thing as that uh, uh, little map we had on the first slide. Here are the people crowded around listening to the preaching. There's the platform. You can see the tents in the background. And you can see there's a lot going on here. That, that revival meetings, these camp meetings, were social events as well as religious ones. Uh, you know, in many instances, this would be the biggest crowd that country people were ever in in their lives. Um, it's a good chance to see old friends you hadn't seen for a year, a chance to meet people. Uh, it's it's kind of a party as well as uh, as well as a religious occasion, and that's very very typical. Here's a slide of a method of circuit riders. And I've talked about all these young men going into the backcountry. Uh, Methodists and Baptists had two different methods. What the Baptists did is they just tried to flood the backcountry with these young preachers, many of whom were basically uneducated. Uh, there were some Baptist preachers who were even illiterate in the Second Great Awakening. Uh, so that's one of the reasons there's so much hostility to, um, to educated clergy, that, you know, the Harvard and Yale graduates. Uh, that's what the, the Baptists did. The Methodists had a system. They had fewer preachers, but the preachers would ride a circuit, and that's what this guy's doing here. They would start out uh, in a place, they'd preach there, they'd move on to another place, and then every two months or so they'd be back where they started and, and beginning their loop again. So they're always on the move. That's why I said earlier, you know, you really, it's difficult for a married man to do this job. It's difficult for uh, a man who's not relatively youthful and energetic to do this job. I mean, you know, this uh, cartoon shows uh, a minister out in a driving rainstorm, trudging along, miserably wet, um, why is he trudging along in such horrible weather? Because he's got to get to the next place in his circuit. So, okay, now there's a revival style that goes along with this, and um, it's kind of related to what George Whitfield did, you know, in, uh, in the First Great Awakening, the way that he got people to become very emotional and uh, and um, that it was uh, religion of the heart and it wasn't the same old-fashioned style of uh, pre-Great Awakening. It's, it's, it's rooted to that. But that religious uh, and emotional strain uh, it comes out even more so in the Second Great Awakening. I remember, Whitefield went to Oxford. He, you know, he was um, an educated man. These new revival preachers in the Second Great Awakening are rough and tumble and... Uh, they um, 
they highlight the emotional side of religion in to the extreme. Um, and that's something that's still with us in a way. So here's a, a famous example. His name was Lorenzo Dow. He was a Methodist. He started his career in Vermont in 1798. He's from Connecticut. Um, and Lorenzo Dow was known as Crazy Dow. Uh, he'd really do anything to get people to pay attention to him. He'd, uh, he'd you know, famously in Middlebury, Vermont, when he spawns the Methodist Church in Middlebury, he goes down to the banks of the Otter Creek and he starts to sing at the top of his lungs and until a bunch of people come wandering by to see what this crazy person is up to, and then he starts to preach. He'd do anything for attention. He was completely shameless. Um, he was famous for only owning one suit of clothes at a time. He'd wear it until it started to fall off his body, in which case he'd accept a donation from somebody, and the donated clothes never fit right. And he'd wear, you know, this ill-fitting uh, new suit until it fell off his body. Uh, amazingly enough, he was married. Um, so Dow, uh, Dow uh, was uh, his nickname was Crazy. Now this is his preaching style here. You can see him preaching to this crowd. Look at the people reacting. They're on their knees. A few of them have are lying um, uh, on the ground. Um, uh, uh, prostrating themselves. There's, um, uh, you know, all sorts of emotion in the scene. Uh, Dow was famous for that. And that is typical of the style of the Second Great Awakening. A lot of the things that uh, we still see in Pentecostal religion, uh, maybe the black church, some of the wilder Baptist churches, uh, the uh, call and response, the uh, the outbursts of emotion, uh, the rising of the hands to the sky, speaking in tongues, all of that kind of stuff is famously characteristic of the backwoods aspect of the Second Great Awakening. Uh, here's um, camp meeting in 1839. See, this is I've showed you now things from 1809 to 1839. It's it, it's hard to put a, a exact dates in the Second Great Awakening. Um, in a sense, it it never really goes away. But anyway, here's a camp meeting from 1839. We see the tents in the background again, and look at all the people in the foreground responding to the the preaching. They're falling over. They're on their knees in the ground. There's a guy way in the foreground on the right who seems to have collapsed. He's covering his eyes. There are people lifting their arms in the air. There's all sorts of craziness going on, and the Second Great Awakening was well known for that. Here's another example. This is earlier. Uh, this would be more like 1809 and 1839. And the lady in the front is kind of fainting, but she's got throwing her arms to heaven at the same time, and people on their knees, and all sorts of shenanigans going on uh, in response to the preaching. Okay. That's the backcountry, and it tends to be country folk, obviously, in the backcountry, but there's something going on with middle-class people. Now, this is a close-up of the slide we looked at just before. I talked about the lady fainting and everything, but look off to the left there. There's that guy who's commenting to the woman. Um, they're standing off to the side. Uh, they're very well-dressed, um, and they're not participants. They're middle-class observers of the awakening. In fact, based on the expression of the man, you think they're there to smirk a little bit and laugh at all the shenanigans. And that is typical of these revivals, too. Look at this slide. Here's another revival in process. We see the usual people praying and crying and everything. Um, what do we see off to the side? The men in black suits, just to the, to the right of the, um, of, uh, of the platform. Uh, they're just watching, and we can see some men in top hats over there. They're off to the side. They're physically apart from the revival. They're very well dressed. Um, they are there to observe. And there's also another guy in the lower left-hand corner. Same thing. There he is, gesticulating, uh, making some point about what's going on. Very well dressed. And then on the other side, we see this guy in the top hat. So there are these middle-class observers, and they are there, uh, I think... Uh, to feel a little bit superior to the goings-on. Um, but some of these guys can't help themselves, and they get converted. Revivalism becomes respectable. Great Awakening, Second Great Awakening moves north, it moves into cities, and it moves into the middle class, and when those things happen, it changes its nature. 
All right, so here's Philadelphia in um, in the Second Great Awakening, and we see Negro Methodists here having a revival meeting. So this happens to be urban, but otherwise it's the exact same scene we just saw in the country. People lifting up their arms, people yelling, people falling down with the Holy Spirit in them, all sorts of craziness going on. Um, but it's a black scene. It's a black preacher. These people are free in Philadelphia. There's a black preacher. Um, one of the characteristics of the Second Great Awakening is it appears to be the time we don't can't say for sure, and obviously different for different individuals in different places and so forth. But for the most part, it appears to be the time when um, um, uh, Black America becomes um, Christian. Uh, for the most part, you know, overwhelmingly, uh, 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 African Americans are evangelical Christians today, Baptist and Methodist primarily. Those are the denominations of the Great Awakening, and for the most part, w they probably become so. Their ancestors probably became so during the Second Great Awakening. Some earlier, maybe, um, not too many later, though. By the Civil War, slaves are all evangelical Christians. Um, so what's going on in the revival here among black people is the same. I, I, t I pointed out there are Negro tents in the Southern revivals. Lots and lots of slaves get converted uh, during the Second Great Awakening. These people happen to be free and in a city, but it's the same phenomenon. Uh, uh, it's part of this culturally uh, widespread phenomenon in the Second Great Awakening. So it comes into the cities, and the roots of the black church, the independent black church, are in the Second Great Awakening. Okay, that's one way it moves into the cities, but it also moves into the white middle classes, and that's what we're going to talk about now. The white middle class gets converted, but they remain middle class. You know, they're not into all this falling down, crying out, and you know, throwing your arms in the air, and I mean, they're too sedate for that. They're too, they're too uh, uptight. So uh, they react the way middle class people do, um, and they make revivalism respectable. Respectable. Um, so here's a family handing out tracts in 1825. What are tracts? They're printed pamphlets. Um, and that's one of the ways things middle class people do. They're much more literate, obviously. Um, they've got more money. They've got access to the printing press. And the steam printing press is just coming into use, making it possible to print lots and lots of different material. Um, so that they are uh, doing the respectable uh, business um, uh, of trying to convert people without a lot of yelling and screaming and crying. Here are some of the tracts. You can see that the New England uh, Tract Societies found in 1814 and the American Tract Societies found in 1823. So here's one on everlasting punishment and here's one on suffer the little children that come in unto me. You know, Jesus uh, uh, says that in, in the Gospel of Luke. Um, and uh, it has all this language in it um, about uh, you know evangelical religion. Um, Reader, I love your soul and want it to be saved. I am therefore going to tell you something about hell. Um, do not throw this down this tract when you see that word, but read on. You know, they're used to people dismissing them, so uh, they're going to try to do anything to get you to keep reading. Here's another one. And look how modern this language is. Are you born again? This is one of the most important questions in religion. Jesus Christ says, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Are you born again? It is not enough to reply you have been baptized and go to church and you suppose you are. Um, and so forth and so on. Very, I mean, you can, you can hear that exact rhetoric today. Uh, millions of Americans who are members of evangelical churches um, uh, still speak that way. Um, okay, so these middle class pamphleteers, they all, the other thing they do, middle class people, is organize. The middle class is, you know, that's how people live their lives. They organ, they're organized and create associations and so forth. And we can see the organization of the Second Great Awakening here. 
reports of the American Home Missionary Society, and we get all of these names, all these ministers on the left, and they're all numbered, look, up to 701 on this page. Um, and then the next column is where they are. There's one in Guildhall, Vermont. The Reverend F.P. Smith, number 692, is in Guildhall, Vermont, September of 1842. Then these various columns about the numbers of people converted and the amount of money raised and you know how many of them are men and how many women and all that stuff. And then little notes. In the case of Reverend Smith, it says revival in progress, 20 conversions, pretty good healthy uh, yield in Guildhall, Vermont, uh, and $23 in contributions. So... Um, the, res the awakening becomes respectable, it becomes highly organized, um, and it begins to spread out in all sorts of interesting ways. The floating church of, of the Savior for Seamen in New York in 1844. We've got all these sailors in New York, and they're rough and tumble, and you can't get them into church. They're, even if they want to go, they're embarrassed because they're so rough and tough. Um, and sailors are notorious for their bad decisions while in port, spending money on women and booze. Um, so why not bring the church to them? And this is an attempt to do that, a floating church in New York Harbor in 1844. So the awakening begins to sprout in all sorts of interesting ways. And that leads us to Charles Finney. Charles Finney is one of the, probably the most famous preacher associated with the Second Great Awakening. There he is. Um, Finney is born in 1792, and he's converted as a young man. He'd been trained as a lawyer. He was a college graduate. He went to Union College uh, in Schenectady. Uh, he uh, uh, becomes converted, and Finney decides to use the methods of... Um, his legal training, as well as the methods of the Methodist um, and Baptist, to bring the awakening to the middle class, and he's he's fabulously successful. Uh, Finney um, uses uh, he talks about swaying uh, sinners the way he's, uh, a lawyer would sway a jury. He uses all the rhetorical tricks he he learned as a uh, as a lawyer. Um, he uses psychological tricks. Uh, he had a uh, big practitioner of something called the anxious bench where they they take the people who were unsure and they didn't know whether they were going to be converted or not and they put them right in the front row and then work on them, call them individually by name. Uh, he was also a big believer in follow-up. He knew that people could get excited during a, a revival and say they're converted and thank God, you know, God's come into my soul and all this stuff. But, you know, if you leave them alone and you go away, you know, a couple of weeks go by, they're probably going to fall into their old bad habits. So, Finney believed in lots of follow-up. You convert people, and then what do you do? You invite them. You know, come on next week, brother. We're going to have a, a young men's um, meeting. Or, you know, come on, sister. Uh, the young women are going to get together and uh, do good works together. You bring them, you get them involved socially. Uh, you get them busy. Um, you can continue uh, the work of the revival and that they join prayer circles and Bible study clubs and stuff like that and you you, 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 you know you incorporate them into your church. You can't just say, oh you're converted, all the work is done, uh, see you in a few weeks. It's not going to work. So Finney um, was very, very organized, very, very methodical, very unapologetic about being organized and methodical. He said that that ministers had to be more like the politicians and do anything they could to get attention. Um, and he's he's great at it. Um, there he is as an older man. He eventually goes to Oberlin, um, becomes a professor at Oberlin College in Ohio. Um, skip that quotation. Here's where he works, um, the Western Erie Canal District. So this ties us back to our transportation lecture. Um, uh, Finney uh, travels back and forth up and down the Erie Canal and um, you can see all of these different religious related events going on in the Erie Canal area in the early 1830s. Uh, this becomes known as the Burnt Over District because the fire of the Holy Spirit has raged back and forth so many times. Um, uh, it's uh, the heart of the Northern Revival and largely due to the work of Finney. So there's the Erie Canal again and there superimposed on it is uh, the Burnt Over District. Um, Alright. Now Finney's not the only one um, taking part in revivals like this. He's the most famous American minister, but this is a, a nice reminder that um, 
ministers are everywhere in the Second Great Awakening, uh, and they're celebrated figures. Uh, they're very, very prominent men. Uh, so this isn't just a case of uh, a guy like Finney, who's kind of a star. Um, they're all stars. He's, you know, he's the mega star. He's the one we remember still. But there are lots and lots of other people doing similar work, as particularly in these new denominations. Uh, Finney happened to be a Presbyterian, but uh, that's um, that's neither here nor there. All these, all evangelical denominations are are undergoing major revivals in uh, the Second Great Awakening. All right, now let's talk about reform. Now, as I said before, reform movements in the Second Great Awakening are rooted in the evangelical belief in the second coming of Jesus and the notion that you have to prepare for the second coming of Jesus. In, some, in fact, some people argue that Jesus won't come until the world is prepared, until you know people are converted, everyone has had the chance to hear the word of God, you know, all the people in the distant jungles of distant continents and so forth, they've got to hear, hear the good news of the gospel um, and have the chance to be converted uh, and uh, sin has to be eliminated. You know, there's a lot of work to do to prepare for the second coming of Jesus. Other people say, well, Jesus is going to come first and all uh, sin will be cleansed away and so forth. We, don't, we can't expect to do it all before he gets here. But in any case, there's this notion very current uh, among uh, members of society in the early 19th century that uh, we do have to prepare the word world for God and we have you know we're obligated Christians are obligated to go out and make the world better even if it's not preparing the world for Jesus um, it's just part of being a Christian you know the idea that the gospel is the good news and that you have to um, spread the good news um, it's one of your duties. So the idea that uh, you have to make the world better is a very, very embedded idea in the Second Great Awakening, and it turns out to be a very, very potent idea as well. Now, uh, here's another famous minister associated with the Awakening, uh, Lyman Beecher. Uh, Lyman Beecher was um, a old, generation older than uh, Finney, Charles Finney. Uh, Beecher p didn't really like Finney. He thought he was a showboat. Um, and in a lot of ways, Beecher's the old reactionary type. Uh, Beecher had gone to Yale. Yale class of 1795, I believe. Um, he um, b believed that an educated clergy was an absolute necessity. He spent his career in Connecticut and Boston and eventually moved to Cincinnati. Um, he's very much an upper crust, old-fashioned preacher in a lot of ways. So in many ways, it's antithetical to the Second Great Awakening as I've been describing it. On the other hand, Beecher is a guy who's closely associated with the idea of reform. He was somebody who believed that religious people were obligated to try to make the world better. And he um, uh, uh, was a, a founding member of a whole bunch of different reform organization. So that's another way that when we talk about the middle class awakening, uh, it's very distinctive. Re middle class evangelicals, and especially northern middle class evangelicals, were particularly concerned with reform, and I spoke earlier about their organizing impulses of the middle classes. They busily create reform organizations throughout the Second Great Awakening. Lyman Beecher, for example, was a member of the American Temperance Society. He was a member of the American Colonization Society. That was a society that was trying to um, uh, solve the problem of slavery by shipping slaves back to Africa. Um, he was uh, a member of the Home Missionary Society. He was, I think, a member of the Tract Society. He was a very busy man, very involved with all of these different reform movements. He's also famous, by the way, uh, for some of his children. He had, I think, 16 children, an enormous number of children. Three of them became famous. His son, uh, Henry, became uh, a very famous minister uh, in the Civil War period and into the 1870s and 80s. His daughter, Catherine, became a very, very important theoretician of 
how American women should live their lives. She wrote all these advice books about how to be a good wife and mother and the best way to raise children and all sorts of stuff like that. And then his uh, daughter, um, uh, Harriet, Harriet Beecher, uh, married and became Harriet Beecher Stowe. And she was the woman who wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin. Very, very important book in the 1850s. So a really distinguished family, um, and one closely, I mean, uh, associated with the idea of reform. I mean, when you think of Harriet Beecher Stowe and her anti-slavery activities, that's uh, rooted in the Second Great Awakening and this evangelical impulse to uh, make the world better. Very much in her family's tradition, too. So there's Lyman in his old age. Um, all right. Uh, so reform is very, very important in the Second Great Awakening. And the most famous and important of the reforms of the Second Great Awakening is temperance. Temperance means uh, the promotion of being temperate, um, you know, moderation in all things. But temperance is really a word that comes to mean very, very quickly the anti-alcohol movement. It may start out as trying to um, promote people acting temperately, but that doesn't last long. As we know, alcohol is an addictive drug, and it's a horrible addiction. Um, and uh, you can't uh, uh, expect an alcoholic to be temperate in his or her use of alcohol. Uh, uh, it doesn't work. So the temperance movement becomes an anti-alcohol movement, and this is the longest-lasting reform movement in the history of the United States. Mothers Against Drunk Driving is rooted in the temperance, anti-temperance, uh, sorry, the anti-alcohol movement of um, the 18-teens. It's almost 200-year-old social reform movement today. Now, why is that? Well, this is the slide we looked at before. Um, this is, uh, on the left, annual consumption of distilled spirits. It's the hard stuff, rum, whiskey, gin, brandy. And then on the right, annual consumption of all alcohol, uh, all alcoholic beverages, um, including hard cider and beer um, and wine. Um, in the United States, and you can see before the 1820s, peaks about 1820, uh, I don't know, uh, maybe 1830 or 40 even, um, Americans consume a tremendous amount of alcohol, and then it drops off, look, it's like it falls off a cliff between about 1840 and 1850. Well, what happens? What happens is the anti-alcohol movement. Um, uh, and they have good reason uh, to be so fiercely anti-alcohol. Americans in 1800, 1820 or so are consuming far more, four or five times more, it's estimated, than Americans drink today. Uh, so alcohol addiction, as you can imagine, is a horrible problem. You know, all the alcoholics out there today, um, and then... Um, uh, you know, if we wanted to add to them, anybody's addicted to prescription medicine or meth or heroin, you know, all these terrible addiction problems we have today. Uh, they weren't there then. Everybody who was, you know, an addict was addicted to alcohol. So it's a horrible, horrible social problem. And when people who are inspired by the Second Great Awakening to build a better world look around and they say, you know, what can we do to make the world better? Well, one of the screamingly obvious things in the 1820s is to think about ending the scourge of alcohol. And that's where the temperance movement comes in. The temperance movement is a reform movement that grows out of the religious impulses of the Second Great Awakening. So here's a temperance certificate. Uh, if you joined the temperance movement, uh, they called it taking the pledge. You'd, you'd sign a, a piece of paper swearing that you weren't going to drink anymore. And the temperance movement wasn't just for alcoholics. It was for anybody who thought that alcohol was bad. So um, it wasn't quite the equivalent of being in AA, you know, where you, you have, you're admitting you have this horrible problem that you can't deal with. Anybody could take the pledge. Uh, and if you took the pledge, uh, you become a member of the Temperance Society, and uh, you're supposed to be proud of it. So uh, this is a certificate. Uh, you know, this is to certify that so-and-so is a member of the Temperance Society. 
uh, and you'd put that on your wall or keep it with your Bible or something. Um, and uh, the picture is showing uh, the good effects of being in the temperance society, of you know being respectable and well dressed because you're not spending your money on booze and you're not missing work and getting fired and so forth, of having respectable women in your life, um, of being you know a solid, upstanding uh, man. Uh, and in the background, we can see the boozers at the tavern. Um, Here's a son of temperance. This guy's taking the pledge. Uh, this is a certificate he would hang on the wall. And the image shows uh, a temperance advocate in with that kind of bib around his neck, um, which was a symbol of being the son of temperance. The 19th century is the biggest period for the fraternal order. Uh, in, a, in a way, uh, being a son of temperance was being like a mason or an elk or an odd fellow or an eagle, any of those sorts of things. But in another way, it's different uh, because it means you pledge to change your life. You don't want to let alcohol touch your lips and uh, so forth and so on. So temperance movement, very, very widespread. It's the easily the most widespread reform movement of the day. All right, uh, lots and lots of anti-alcohol propaganda. Um, now this is a series, it's an eight-part series. It's called The Bottle, a series of lithographs, and it purports to show the effects of alcohol. And I might say that in this instance, this series is by an English illustrator, a guy named George Cruikshank. Um, it's a big bestseller, and it shows that this reform movement is a transatlantic one. It takes place outside of um, the United States as well as inside. And this is, you know, I've been hammering the steam home over the course of the semester. This is um, uh, uh, one of the ways in which the United States and Britain are, are, are closely related culturally. Anyway, here we are in plate one of the bottle, and we see this happy home. It's a prosperous working man's home. Um, he's, um, uh, we know it's prosperous because of the pictures on the wall, the mirror, that very nice, um, grandfather clock, the solid furniture, the carpeting, the clothes they're wearing, the roaring coal fire in the grate. This is a happy and secure home, but something bad is being introduced into it. The bottle, it is brought out for the first time. The husband induces his wife just to take a drop. So they begin drinking, and that's the downfall of the family. We're going to skip all the way forward. You can imagine nothing good is happening. We're going to skip all the way forward to plate seven. The bottle. The husband, in a state of furious drunkenness, kills his wife with the instrument of their misery. Well, he's beamed her to death with his uh, empty booze bottle. And everybody rushes in, and he's horrified at his terrible crime. And look, it's the same apartment. They haven't moved. It's the same place. But everything's gone. They've had to sell their furniture and their nice clothes and... Um, their mirrors and their pictures and their carpet to pay for their addiction to alcohol. They don't have a nice coal fire anymore. They're freezing in there. Uh, life is miserable. And you can see the children are wearing rags. This little boy by the fireplace and the girl in the blue dress right in the center crying over her dead mother. Now, you may recall that there was a baby in the first picture. Well, she's dead. Uh, she died in plate five or so of neglect. Um, so the bottle does its work. By the way, the guys in the black top hats and black suits, they're the police. They're taking them away. Um, uh, that's plate seven. You think they can't sink any lower, but then we get to plate eight. The bottle has done its work. It has destroyed the infant and the mother. It has brought the son and the daughter to vice into the streets and has left the father a hopeless maniac. So here we have the children uh, visiting their alcoholic mad father in the lunatic asylum. Uh, and you think, well, maybe things are looking up a little. Their clothes are a lot nicer than they were in Plate 7. But no, in Plate 8, 
uh, the boy has turned into a street thug, and uh, the girl is now a prostitute. So that is the effect of alcohol. A lot, you know, obviously very, very melodramatic stuff. Um, but you know, there's no denying uh, that to this day, alcohol is a horrible social problem. And it just happens to be melodramatic because it's pure. And here's another very, very common play. Uh, you see this all over the place, the drunkard's progress. And you can see step one, he has a glass with a friend, but then he keeps drinking, making excuses, he gets dr becomes an alcoholic, and then the downhill side, poverty and disease, forsaken by friends, desperation and crime, death by suicide. So this is about how alcohol ruins a life. But it's about more than that. In addition, it's about how alcohol ruins families. At the bottom here, we see the wife and the baby of the alcoholic, and their house is literally on fire, the, the home is destroyed, the woman and child abandoned, she's got horrible prospect of trying to keep her, her, um, her child fed uh, without a man in her life. Um, and really, we're now getting the roots of the reform movement. In a lot of ways, the temperance movement is a woman's movement because alcohol is destroying families and women are, as we talked about, the moral center of family life in 19th century America. And in addition, women have very limited means to um, uh, fix a mistake uh, that they'd make in marrying a man who becomes an alcoholic. If you're a woman in America and you're a married woman, uh, you don't legally exist anymore. Uh, there's no right to separate property. Uh, there's, uh, there's, you know, very, very limited rights at all. It's terribly difficult to get a divorce. You, there's no child support. I mean, there's, there, women who are married to alcoholic men have horrific lives. They're, they are stuck. Um, and, um, uh, and that's why, in many ways, this reform movement is a woman's movement. Now, another transatlantic example. This is the same thing, except this is the British version. The same nine steps. In fact, um, the same uh, drawings in many cases. Um, here's another one. The Bible and Temperance. Now, this is a lot like The Drunkard's Progress or... Uh, the bottle, uh, in, in this case, a respectable working man. Once again, we have the home with the hearth and the furniture and everything. Um, he is, um, his buddy comes by to take him out drinking. And his, his wife tells him, don't go, don't go. But he's, oh, what's the harm? And I'm going to go out, you know, celebrate a little bit. Something good happened at work today or whatever. He goes out and he becomes a raging alcoholic. Once again, we have the son and the daughter and so forth. Well, here we are a few years later. Again, same room, but they're down to nothing in their furniture. They're wearing rags. Things are horrible. But in this case, there's a minister who comes by, and he's reading the Bible with the family. And something happens. The, the drunken husband in the corner, something happens. He's touched somehow, and he decides, God enters into his life, and he decides to change his life. And here he is. He's jumped out of bed. He said, I'm going to be a different man now. They're throwing the booze away. The children and the wife are thrilled. They're praising God for the, the change in their, their husband and father's life. And things start to get better for this family. There they are a few later, a few years later. Um, he's working again. They're prosperous again. He's not drinking anymore. Family life is improved. Um, and they're once again respectable members of society. So, if you do become temperate, not all is lost. Your life can, you know, you can rejoin the living and, and re rejoin respectable society. No, it's a message that you know, continues in, in the alcohol reform movement or any kind of narcotics reform movement, you know. You give the stuff up, you take the pledge, you turn your life over to a higher power, and, uh, and you know, life can improve. And here's one called the Fruits of Temperance. Now, in this case, we don't have the story of things getting, you know, 
bad and, uh, and going into the gutter and everything. In this case, this is somebody who uh, just happens to be tempered, and um, there's there we have one of our beautiful new factories in the background, part of the uh, market revolution, uh, and the prosperous home that results from that. He's back from work at the at the mill, um, well dressed with a happy, healthy, loving family in a in a cozy home. Whenever you see a vine on a home in a 19th century print, uh, that's a sign of coziness and domestic happiness. That's what that always means. And this is what temperance will get you. A loving, healthy family life and you know, all the joy that that brings. Um, this is the type of um, temperance propaganda all over the place, well into the 20th century. Sad song about fathers are drunken and mothers dead. Um, okay. Now we're going to talk about other reform movements. Uh, very, very quickly, I'm just going to zip through them. Um, penitentiary reform is a reform of the Second Great Awakening. This is the Eastern State, Pensure, State Penitentiary in Philadelphia. The word penitentiary comes into vogue now instead of prison. What's the difference between a prison and a penitentiary? A penitentiary is a place where you can become penitent. Uh, you can think about your life and change it. And these new prisons, like the Eastern State Penitentiary in Philadelphia, they try to emulate the lives of monks. Monks lives in, live in cells. They live in isolated cells as individuals. They take vows of silence. The Eastern State Penitentiary had a, a rule of silence. Monks do physical labor part of the day. You can see gardens between the cell blocks in this um, picture here. Um, and um, monks study their Bible. So prisoners at this penitentiary would uh, live in silence, work outside, and then uh, study their Bible. They'd be left in in their cell with nothing but a Bible, and eventually they'd get bored enough to start to, to read it. Uh, and the hope was they would emerge as better men. American, I'll skip that one. American prisons are famous for um, their reform um, reform ways in um, uh, this period. Uh, Alexis de Tocqueville, when he comes to America in 1831, uh, this French aristocrat, he is here to study our prison system. There's the Eastern State Penitentiary today. Next couple slides are the interior. Another view of the blocks, and this is what they look like. And you know, obviously, it doesn't work in the long run, and this becomes a horrendous hellhole. Um, that's what the, one of the cells looked like. Uh, you can imagine slowly going crazy in there, locked in with nothing but a Bible. Um, so prison reforms are one of the reforms that come out of the Second Great Awakening. Lots of social agencies. Insane asylums. Before the Second Great Awakening, crazy people are locked up or, you know, uh, on the, they're taken care of by their family if they're lucky, and uh, you know, locked in attics and basements if they're not. Uh, another lunatic asylum here. Uh, there's the one outside of Boston, a big one, 1860. The idea that the state is, should take care of uh, these unfortunates and that um, they should have uh, clean and uh, uh, um, clean and uh, caring facilities um, that becomes uh, prominent during this time. There's the one in Vermont, which is still in existence, the Brattleboro Retreat, same building, in fact, um, founded in 1836. Reform schools. Uh, we're going to take children off the streets, and instead of punishing them, we're going to treat them like, you know, uh, uh, like the promising young men and women they are, and, uh, and turn them into responsible adults. The American Female Guardian Society and Home for the Friendless is a home for prostitutes um, in New York City. Uh, you know, all these, the idea is that these women are unfortunate, they're driven to this, um, this these circumstances um, by bad luck and by abandonment and so forth, and that we should understand their plight, and instead of judging them, try to lift them up as our, our sisters in the Lord, and... Um, uh, give them a fresh start, give them training to do something else with their lives, and so forth. That's what this this uh, uh, 
the Guardian Society is for. Um, uh, poor houses. Another product of the Second Great Awakening. We can't just abandon the poor. You know, Jesus gives us his example in the Bible of taking care of the poor. Uh, we have to reform the world. Let's take care of the poor. Uh, education reform. Uh, this is Horace Mann, who's famous education reformer, still studied in uh, education classes, uh, secretary of the Massachusetts Board of Education, a big advocate of the common school, that is, you know, grade school for everyone. Um, and he believes that if we have proper schools, as he says, nine-tenths of the crimes in the penal code would become obsolete. A long catalog of human ills would be a bridge. So educational reform is another reform movement root in Second Great Awakening. Um, Robert Owen is the founder of a commune, and we can begin to get communal responses uh, to the problems of the world. We're going we're gonna to separate ourselves and build a perfect society. That's what Owen tries to do in a New Harmony, Indiana. Owen was a Scot, by the way. He made a lot of money in the textile industry and spent it trying to make a better world. The Shakers are the most famous example of uh, a religious denomination that prophets in the Second Great Awakening. Um, the Shakers go back to the 1790s, but um, uh, during the Second Awakening, uh, new religious denominations uh, become uh, uh, proliferate during this period. The Shakers succeed very well, get lots and lots of converts during this time. You can see here that the Shakers believe in racial equality. You can see on the right, the far right, there are two black Shakers in that crowd, two men on the, on the, the last row there. Um, they believed in equality between the sexes, too. Uh, men and women had equal standing in Shaker communities. What they didn't believe in was marriage and sex, um, and Shakers didn't have babies, and that's why there aren't any Shakers anymore. They, there are, I think, something like seven or eight Shakers left, and I think uh, all of them but one are, are very, very elderly women. There's one young Shaker that helps to care for them. Uh, and that's one of the Shaker communities. They're famous for their design sense, for the quality of their work, um, their furniture, that clock there in the background. Um, here's another denomination, the Millerites, that's founded by uh, a Vermonter. William Miller's uh, from Pulteney, Vermont. Uh, and Miller predicts the end of the world in the 1840s um, and uh, starts a new religious denomination. And still around, the Seventh-day Adventists are, are Millerites. Let's get through these. And then finally, uh, one of the longest lasting and probably arguably most important uh, groups that comes out of the Second Great Awakening are the Mormons. Um, so, um, we get all of these reforms. We get alcohol reform. We get... Um, all of these reform, social reform movements, poor houses and insane asylums and homes for prostitutes and so forth. And we get new religious denominations all coming out of the Second Great Awakening. And then finally, we get what we're going to be talking about in subsequent lectures, the idea that slavery is immoral, that God is against human slavery, and that uh, people in America need to do something about that, in other words, abolitionism, that comes about uh, as yet another reform rooted in the Second Great Awakening, and that's what we'll be talking about in um, uh, subsequent lectures.